For the reader of the Dune series, their take on the book as an ecological primer is presented by Herbert through immersion in the Fremen culture, as viewed through the eyes of the Atreides and the third person narrator. The Fremen were once a people known as the Zen Sunni Wanderers, sent into forced migration again and again over countless years, taking them from one world to the next. The reasons for their persecutions are not altogether clear but it seems likely they are founded in their religious beliefs. The Fremen in Dune can be viewed very much as a nomadic race of people whose belief systems are centred upon the religions of Zen Buddhism and Islam, and whose cultural stock is not far removed from that of the Bedouin. Everything about the Fremen, every single facet of their society has been fully optimised and refined to allow these people to survive on Arrakis from the clothes they wear, their methods of combat and travel, to their religion and economy. The Fremen are first described as people who lived at the desert edge without Cade or Bashar to command them, Willow the Sand people, marked down on no census of the Imperial Regit. By not appearing on the Imperial census, and by not participating in the feudal Faufrilaic system, the Fremen appear to be of limited numbers to both the agents of the Emperor and the Harkonnen when they rule Arrakis. It is only Duke Leto I and his staff who suspect that they exist in vast numbers, and may be the army that he seeks. Paul's education by his instructors provides us with some insight into this nomadic people of the desert. When discussing the Fremen's blue eyes, Paul tells Dr. Yui that he thinks they must be brave to live at the edge of that desert, and it becomes clear that the desert mystique of these people is already intriguing the young man before he has ever set eyes upon them. Yui tells him, they compose poems to their knives, their women are as fierce as the men, even Fremen children are violent and dangerous. As a people the Fremen are indeed violent and dangerous, hating the Harkonnen and killing them wherever they find them. In order to gain their attention, Duke Leto I instructs his swordmaster Duncan Idaho to liaise with the Fremen, believing correctly that Duncan possesses qualities that they will relate to. He tells Paul that his swordmaster is a proud and ruthless man, Duncan, but fond of the truth. I think the Fremen will admire him. If we're lucky, they may judge us by him. Duke Leto I judges the Fremen correctly here for these are indeed by their nature qualities that the best men and women of the sieges possess. The first notable Fremen that the reader encounters is Shadot Mapes, the head housekeeper of the palace at Arakin, who is more than she appears. Although the separation of desert Fremen and urban Fremen seems obvious by their society, they are for the most part a single people with no separate allegiances or politics. Shadowed Mapes has a hidden agenda which is seemingly focused around the mysticism inherent with the Fremen, especially with regard to Paul as their Madi and of his mother the Lady Jessica. The Duke Leto recommends that the Lady Jessica retain Mapes as the head housekeeper when the Atreides arrive in Arakin, even though he is aware of the old woman's keen interest to serve her in particular. Mapes provides a general introduction to the physicality of the Fremen, and to the nature of water conservation on Arrakis. Mapes' features suggest a consistency of appearance amongst the Fremen to the Lady Jessica when they first meet, as she notes that the woman looked as wrinkled and desiccated, pruned dry and undernourished. She does however remind herself that Leto had said they were strong and vital, and there were the eyes of course, that wash of deepest darkest blue without any white secretive, mysterious. Mapes has been sent by the Fremen to test the Lady Jessica against their myths of the Madi and his mother, and she bears literally and metaphorically a two-edged gift. Mapes brings a Chris knife, one of the traditional and ritual weapons of the Fremen made from a tooth of a sandworm. In questioning Jessica, Mapes hopes to determine if she really is the woman described by their legends, in actuality part of the Missionaria Protectiva. If this proves to be the case, then Mapes is to give the Chris knife as a gift to Jessica, if not the weapon is to be used to kill her. 
It is when Jessica determines the meaning of the Chris knife, which she states as maker, though intending to say maker of death instead, that the old woman accepts her as indeed being part of the legend. The knife as a weapon is revealing as to how the Fremen look at death, and the extent to which they go in order to preserve water. When the Fremen kill someone, they take the water from their body, preserving it out of necessity. When offered the weapon, Jessica notes that there is a glistening fluid upon its edge, which at first she suspects is poison. The blade according to Fremen custom cannot be drawn and sheathed again without shedding blood. Mapes offers Jessica the water of her life, but rather than killing the old woman, she instead gives her a slight scratch, whereupon the blood wells up and stops flowing almost immediately. Jessica realises that the blade is actually coated with ultra-frost coagulation, the purpose of which is to prevent the loss of the body's moisture from a victim of the weapon. In taking a life, the Fremen are very careful to spill as little of an enemy's blood as possible, so that the water from it can be retained. This custom has led to those not from Arrakis believing the Fremen drink the blood of their own dead. The Atreides are also introduced to the Fremen through Dr Liet Kynes, the Imperial Planetologist and briefly the Fremen Naib Stilgar, leader of Siege Tabar. Once House Atreides has fallen and Arrakis is again in the hands of the Harkonnen and the Emperor, Paul and his mother Jessica flee into the deep desert, where they take refuge with Stilgar and his tribe of Fremen who call their home Siege Tabar. It is through Stilgar that the reader, along with Paul and Jessica, come to learn many of the ways of the Fremen and their relationship to the desert. As Paul becomes accustomed to Fremen life, he realises that he is being immersed in a culture that is harsh yet fully integrated into the ecology of Arrakis, what Herbert referred to as the ideas inflicted upon a society by their environment and the moral and ethical laws it creates. It came to him that he was surrounded by a way of life that could only be understood by postulating an ecology of ideas and values. He felt that this Fremen world was fishing for him, trying to snare him in its ways. Much of this new way of life is introduced to Paul and Jessica by Stilgar, who had before the fall of House Atreides accepted Duncan Idaho into his siege as a representative of the Duke's family on the condition that he served the siege as well as his old masters. He is a man described as having an aura of power that radiated from him, and is a tough yet fair and pragmatic leader, prone to succumbing as all Fremen do, to the tides of superstition that permeate their religious outlook. When accepting the dual allegiance of Duncan Idaho, he initially reveals some of the Fremen's water customs, allowing the Duke to keep the body of his fallen comrade Turok, but insisting that Duncan Idaho's water is ours. He also reveals early on to the Atreides that the mysterious Liet is in all probability a real person, telling them that he also serves two masters. Stilgar's belief in the Fremen superstitions sown by the Missionaria Protectiva is in one part what saves the Atreides from death. When Paul and Jessica first encounter Stilgar's troop from Siege Tavar, his men, and in particular Jamis, demand the Atreides fugitives are killed for their water as their laws require. These again are the harsh realities imposed on the collective by the environment itself, the law the Fremen call Istisla. You know the law, said the voice from the rocks, ones who cannot live with the desert. Be quiet, Stilgar said. Times change. Stilgar counters Jamis by letting him know that his only concern is for the strength of the tribe, and reminds him that they have received a communication relating Paul and Jessica's worth to the tribe. Stilgar's pragmatism for his people is measured by his uncertainty as to whether Paul is the Lisan al Gaib, and his decision is to allow Paul to live, but to take Jessica's water for the tribe. It is well that you see the reason, Stilgar said. We cannot dally here to test you, woman. Do you understand? We'd not want your shade to plague us. I will take the boy man, your son, and he shall have my countenance, sanctuary in my tribe. But for you, woman, 
you understand there is nothing personal in this. It is the rule, istisla, in the general interest. Is that not enough? Paul took a half step forward. What are you talking about? Stilgar flicked a glance across Paul, but kept his attention on Jessica. Unless you've been deep trained from childhood to live here, you could bring destruction onto an entire tribe. It is the law, and we cannot carry useless. Jessica is only spared death by proving her worth to Stilgar, and does so by easily overpowering him with the weirding way, the Bene Gesserit martial art. The Fremen are astonished at her speed and martial prowess, and Stilgar informs her, We mean no harm to you now. Great gods, if you can do this to the strongest of us, you're worth ten times your weight of water. Even when some of his tribe are unsure whether to attack Jessica while she holds their leader hostage, Stilgar is forced to exclaim, Can't you see the worth of this woman? The conversation reveals more of the nature of water scarcity on Arrakis and how the Fremen measure value, as well as indicating the harsh realities that they live by. Herbert reiterates the nature of his higher moral and ethical laws when Jessica seeks assurances for her and Paul's safety amongst the Fremen. When questioning the truthfulness of Stilgar's word, his tone changes towards her, saying, we make no evening promises to be broken at dawn. When a man says a thing, that's the contract. More of the Fremen customs and their law of istisla are revealed to the Atreides fugitives as they travel to the first stop of Stilgar's troop on the way to Sich Tabar, the Cave of Ridges. The Fremen travel by night and rest during the day, hurrying to get under cover before the harsh sun rises. Provided with a place to rest, Paul and his mother are provided with food that reeked of spice. As they rest and eat, Stilgar calls out for men to place door seals at the cave entrance to see to moisture security. When the Fremen are at rest, they remove their stillsuits, the vital piece of equipment they use to maintain their body's water when in the desert. Stilgar takes Jessica aside and points across the desert to where their ultimate destination lies and indicates in the distance his people working to the last minute to collect the spice. The discussion leads Jessica to admire Stilgar's people for their discipline, but Stilgar's intent in taking her aside is to explain further some of the Fremen's ways. He tells her the discipline is part of their tribal life, and also that it is the way we choose among us for a leader. The leader is the one who is strongest, the one who brings water and security. In besting Stilgar in combat, Jessica has raised a problem for him, in that he is no longer seen as the strongest. Curious as to what this means, Stilgar explains to her that although she defeated him, the Fremen attribute this to her use of the weirding way, which they hope to learn, and that his position is not in jeopardy in that Jessica has not formally called him out. He notes that some members of his troop are curious to see if Jessica intends to call him out in a leadership challenge, but that ultimately if she succeeded, they would not follow her as she is not of the sand, a fact which he demonstrated during the previous night's crossing to the Cave of Ridges. Jessica is again impressed by the practical nature of the Fremen, and is curious to find out why they have overstretched themselves at this time in gathering spice to pay the guild. The economic necessities of the Fremen approach to ecology are made apparent here, Herbert demonstrating the need to have an understanding of the economic and political need they have in keeping their environmental ambitions secret. The guild here in this instant represents the exact opposite of the Fremen in the view of the economic requirements presented by the ecology of Arrakis. The bribes that the guild takes from Stilgar's people are purposely to hide the Fremen from any who may wish to observe their activities by satellite. There is little doubt that if the Guild were aware of the Fremen's activities, they themselves would do something to halt them, as the ecological long-term transformation they are working towards will ultimately destroy melange production on Arrakis. The Guild, like so many other groups, rely almost entirely on the use of melange for space travel, 
which in turn grants them a monopoly of power within the Imperium. This is the concept of economic ecology, one that has become popular in eco-politics today and has become a driving force in how governments deal with the growing concern of environmental issues. Jessica stopped in the act of turning away from him, looked back up into his face. The Guild? What has the Guild to do with your spice? It's Liet's command, Stilgar said. We know the reason, but the taste of it sours us. We bribed the Guild with a monstrous payment in spice to keep our skies clear of satellites and such that none may spy what we do to the face of Arrakis. She weighed out her words, remembering that Paul had said this must be the reason Arakeen skies were clear of satellites. And what is it you do to the face of Arrakis that must not be seen? We change it, slowly but with certainty, to make it fit for human life. Our generation will not see it, nor our children, nor our children's children, nor the grandchildren of their children. But it will come. He stared with veiled eyes out over the basin. Open water and tall green plants and people walking freely without stillsuits. So that's the dream of this Liet Kynes, she thought, and she said, Bribes are dangerous. They have a way of growing larger and larger. They grow, he said. But the slow way is the safe way. Stilgar continues to present himself as a man of practicalities, acknowledging that one day Jessica, out of the necessities of the good of the tribe, may have to call him out. He rather unsubtly suggests that Jessica might become one of his wives, but keeping with the myth of the Lisan al Gaib in mind, he presents her with another option, becoming the Sayadina, the Fremen's reverend mother. The following morning Stilgar's rule is being tested by Jamis, a young Fremen man who wishes to fight Paul to the death. Stilgar attempts to dissuade the young man, but Jamis continues to quote law at him, and although Stilgar can be flexible with his interpretation of the law when required, in this case it is the Amtal rule, which is designed to test the integrity of the prophecy regarding Paul and his mother. Paul lingers in killing Jamis, unaware of the fact that the fight is one to the death. The fight represents a number of aspects in viewing the Fremen and their culture. First and foremost it is a rite of passage for Paul, and the Fremen no longer accept him as a mere lad. He is required to be given a tribal name that those amongst his new adopted siege may refer to him by. Paul's success in the Amtal combat has also confirmed to the Fremen that he is indeed their prophesied messiah, the Lisan al Gaib. The name Usul is given to him by the tribe, but he must also choose a name for himself as he enters manhood. Paul ultimately chooses the name of the kangaroo mouse, Muad'Dib, but deigns that he doesn't feel it right to give up the name his father gave him. The Fremen again recognise this as an element of the Lisan al Gaib, reinforcing their myth, in actuality now present in Paul. Again, a murmuring response went through the troop as man turned to man. Wisdom with strength, couldn't ask more, it's the legend for sure. Lisan al Gaib, Lisan al Gaib. I will tell you a thing about your new name, Stilgar said. The choice pleases us. Muad'Dib is wise in the ways of the desert. Muad'Dib creates his own water. Muad'Dib hides from the sun and travels in the cool night. Muad'Dib is fruitful and multiplies over the land. Muad'Dib we call instructor of boys. That is a powerful base on which to build your life, Paul Muad'Dib, who is Usul among us. We welcome you. Water rationing practices are again presented as the Fremen begin to suit up, with the spare water from Jessica and Paul's packs being distributed to those who have lost water over the most recent journey. Stilgar informs Jessica that the water will be repaid to her at field rates, which are a ration of 10 to 1. Jessica, almost ready to protest at this, is cut short by Stilgar, who informs her that it is a wise rule as she will find out. The last water ritual that we encounter before Stilgar's troop reach Siege Tabar are the funeral rites for Jamis, who is buried with honour by the troop. As the ceremony begins, 
Jessica is becoming aware of her thirst, and as she observes the Fremen around her, realises the fact that this whole people could be trained to be thirsty only at given times. Stilgar tells her she will get used to the stillsuit as her body's water content falls to a lower level, and Jessica realises that her unconscious preoccupation with water is in actuality a preoccupation with moisture, and that this was a more subtle and profound matter. The funeral rites for Jamis are a communal affair, involving each member of the troop mentioning some deed of Jamis's that benefited them, or a time when he saved their lives. Jamis's body has all the water removed from it, and Paul is shown this as he is the victor. Stilgar tells Jessica that this is another of the Fremen's rules. The flesh belongs to the person, but his water belongs to the tribe, except in the combat. Not understanding this, Chani explains to Paul that the water is presented to him in this case as it's because you have to fight in the open without stillsuits. The winner has to get his water back that he loses while fighting. Paul's reaction to this highlights the differences between the Atreides and the Fremen. Despondent after being forced to kill for the first time, Paul states quite firmly that he does not want Jamis's water. Chani does not understand this at all stating quite simply that it is water, with an inflection in her voice that carries a great deal to Jessica's trained ear. She chides Paul into accepting Jamis's water in a tone that he recognises, and both of the Atreides come away from this situation with a new and fundamental understanding of water on this desert planet. On Arrakis, water was money. Another important realisation is through the invocation of Shai Hulud by the Fremen during the funeral rites for Jamis, that the Fremen worship the great sandworms of Arrakis in a dualistic fashion. The utterances made for Jamis are to placate his shade, as well as to distribute his possessions, and Paul joins in amongst the friends of the dead Fremen. In his grief at having killed for the first time, Paul cries, garnering an unusual reaction from the tribe. A voice hissed, he sheds tears. It was taken up around the ring. Usul gives moisture to the dead. He felt fingers touch his damp cheek, heard the awed whispers. Nothing on this planet had so forcibly hammered into her the ultimate value of water. Not the water cellars, not the dried skins of the natives, not still suits or the rules of water discipline. Here there is a substance more precious than all others, it was life itself, and entwined all around with symbolism and ritual. Water. The funeral ceremony of Jamis and the events leading up to it are used by Herbert to present a number of the Fremen laws and customs, the economic means by which they proceed on their course for environmental change, the religious take that they have adopted in water preservation, but most importantly of all, the absolute importance of water on Arrakis. Water is wealth, life and death to the Fremen and every aspect of their lives is geared to preserving it where they have it, or gaining new water from the bodies of their enemies and from the very wind itself. Not one drop is wasted, and their abilities to distribute and measure water are incredibly accurate. The water of Jamis's body is measured out, and presented to Paul, totalling 33 litres and 7 and 33 second drachms of the tribe's water. He has become aware of the importance of water to the Fremen in various aspects of life, but one area he has not encountered is in its use in courtship. By now Paul knows the necessity of accepting the water for the tribe, and in doing so when presented with the metal rings which hold the water, asks Chani if she will hold them for him. There is an uncertain moment, and Stilgar tells Chani to keep the rings for Paul, without commitment until it's time to show him the manner of carrying them. Paul realises that he has missed something here, and sensing the feeling of humour around him, something bantering in it, and his mind linked up a prescient memory, water counters offered to a woman. Courtship ritual. The Fremen, in working with the law of minimum, 
have become supreme at gathering water, necessary as it is for not only their basic day to day survival needs, but also as a necessity to begin the ecological transformation of Arrakis. Before Stilgar's troop progress on their way to Siege Tabar, he escorts the Atreides through the areas of the Cave of Ridges previously hidden from them. The cave complex houses many of the trappings of Fremen ecological methods, and as they go past one particular irregular crack in the cave wall, they pass a dark honeycombed lattice that directs cold damp air into the cave from the surface. But it is Jessica who realises the level of the technological achievements of the Fremen, understanding that they have created wind traps from which they gather moisture. Wind trap, she thought. They've a concealed wind trap somewhere on the surface to funnel air down here into cooler regions and precipitate the moisture from it. The wind trap is not the only ecological marvel present in the desert hideaway of the Cave of Ridges. Stilgar escorts them to another region of the cave that illuminates a vast amount of water stretching into the darkness for over a hundred metres. Here Stilgar supervises the Fremen water masters as they empty the water that Paul has won from Jamis into the vast pool. The pool has a water meter which indicates the amount emptied to the exact measurement Paul had received, prompting Jessica to realise that the Fremen have superb accuracy in measurement, and that the key to understanding Fremen technology lies in a simple fact that they were perfectionists. The discipline of the Fremen in regard to this treasure trove of water here is made clear to Paul and Jessica by Stilgar, who tells them that amongst his troop there are those in need of water, yet they would come here and not touch this water. Stilgar informs them that there are more than 38 million decaliters in the Cave of Ridges which they keep sealed off from the water destroying Little Makers, or Sand Trout and that the wealth represented by the water in the cave is only one of many such caches. The superb accuracy of the Fremen and their single mindedness towards their goal is revealed when Stilgar informs them that they know how much water is required to change the face of Arrakis to within a million decaliters. This discussion brings out the religious attitudes of the Fremen towards their ecological dream and as Stilgar tells the Atreides of their intentions in detail, each sentence he utters is responded to by the chanting of the Fremen who call out the required ritual response, Bailal Kaifa. We will trap the dunes beneath grass plantings, Stilgar said, his voice growing stronger. We will tie the water into the soil with trees and undergrowth. Bailal Kaifa, intoned the troop. Each year the polar ice retreats, Stilgar said. By Lal Kaifa, they chanted. We shall make a homeworld of Arrakis, with melting lenses at the poles, with lakes in the temperate zones, and only the deep desert for the maker and his spice. By Lal Kaifa, and no man ever again shall want for water. It shall be his for dipping from well or pond or lake or canal. It shall run down through the quanets to feed our plants. It shall be there for any man to take. It shall be his for holding out his hand. By Lal Kaifa. Jessica felt the religious ritual in the words, noted her own instinctively awed response. They're in league with the future, she thought. They have their mountain to climb. This is the scientist's dream. And these simple people, these peasants, are filled with it. Her thoughts turned to Liet Kynes, the Emperor's planetary ecologist, the man who had gone native, and she wondered at him. This was a dream to capture men's souls, and she could sense the hand of the ecologist in it. This was a dream for which men would die willingly. It was another of the essential ingredients that she felt her son needed. People with a goal. Such people would be easy to imbue with fervour and fanaticism. They could be wielded like a sword to win back Paul's place for him. Jessica here is presenting the realisation of Herbert's great fear of the hero, political, religious or military, who can use and manipulate the ecological movement to their own needs. The Fremen are not just an ecological movement, 
They are a people who have ecology ingrained into every facet of their society. Possibly most important of all, their environmental goals are completely linked to their religious, martial and superstitious outlooks. Their single-mindedness in approaching their ecological dream of transforming their world indicates to Jessica that they are indeed an incredible force to be reckoned with, and one who can return her son to his rightful political and economic position in the Empire. Paul understands this more than Jessica knows, still disturbed by his prescient visions of the jihad that will come, fought in his name and under his family's banner. The introduction of Paul and his mother into the Fremen way of life ends with Paul's realisation of what his mother hopes he can achieve by using these people, whilst not realising the Fremen also wish to use them for their own ends. At this stage Paul is strongly resistant to the prescient visions that are increasingly getting stronger and more vivid, as he is exposed even more to the spice melange which permeates every facet of desert life. In knowing that his mother seeks for him to use the Fremen, which will bring about the Jihad, he comes to a stark conclusion. Paul sat silently in the darkness, a single stark thought dominating his awareness. My mother is my enemy. She does not know it, but she is. She is bringing the Jihad. She bore me. She trained me. She is my enemy. As we see with Paul and Jessica's introduction and immersion in Fremen life, every aspect of their culture is deeply involved around their survival needs in the desert of Arrakis. Herbert's attention to detail is of paramount importance here. Fremen names have resonance with their need for water. Stilgar, or Stilgard, and Shadowed Mapes, or Well Dipper, are obvious indicators of this. Their brutal customs feature the need to remove a body's water for the good of the tribe, and crying is seen as a great act of sacrifice to those who have passed into death. Their gods are dualistic and chthonic representations of the sandworms themselves, as both creator and adversary. The huge worms have even become a source of transport across the vast dunes and an unstoppable land-based war machine. The Fremen's bodies have adapted for the need for long-term water preservation, and have evolved with elongated intestines. The harshness of their existence shows that the tribes do not tolerate anyone who may bring harm to the siege because of ineptitude in the ways of the desert, or even through disability. As such we see the Fremen prepare to kill Jessica, thinking her too old to learn their ways. The practice of eugenics is also present, in that the Fremen leave their blind to the desert rather than have them hinder the progress of the tribe. The Fremen are so naturally adapted to life on Arrakis that Herbert examines them from a non-systems viewpoint. In representing an antithesis to western approaches of ecology and environmentalism, the flaw in Herbert's thinking is the Fremen do not have a systemic approach to life. Systems are created by human beings as a means for dealing with problems and their respective associations. Systems represent a means for human beings which, once tested, becomes dependable for dealing with their applications. Systems are indeed a fundamental part of Fremen life, from the means of how they travel, walking without rhythm and in a single file to disguise their numbers, to the way they measure, retain and preserve water by any means possible. The ultimate system that the Fremen have created on Arrakis for water preservation and survival is the still suit. The still suit is an item of clothing worn by the Fremen and only taken off when they reach the safety of Siege or Cave, where they can employ other moisture preservation seals. It is similar in concept to a spacesuit, but its job is to preserve and recycle all of a human being's water within the desert environment ensuring someone who wears one can survive for long periods of time in the desert. The still suit is described as a micro sandwich, a highly efficient filter and heat exchange system, where the skin layer is porous. This allows perspiration to pass through it, having cooled the body, near normal evaporation process. The next two layers include heat exchange filaments and salt precipitators. Salts reclaimed. 
While a Fremen wears a still suit, the motions of the body, especially breathing and some osmotic action, provide the pumping force, while reclaimed water circulates to catch pockets, from which you are able to drink from a tube attached to the neck. Urine and faeces are processed in the thigh pads, and one breathes in through a mouth filter and out through a nose tube. As Kynes points out to the Atreides, with a Fremen suit in good working order, you won't lose more than a thimbleful of moisture a day. The still suit is the ultimate survival tool, a clothing system that allows its wearer to lose a minimum of their body's water in the most extreme of environments. Even certain pack animals use the equivalent of still suits when in the desert environment. Fremen suits are noted for being of extremely high quality and efficiency in water reclamation, beyond those of ordinary suits sold by merchants in cities. It does however represent an idealistic technological system that seemingly stands in contradiction to a number of concepts that Frank Herbert presents in June. As a technological system, the Fremen have a dependency on still suits, as they do with almost all of their water-based technologies. Without them, the Fremen would no doubt be of little real threat to their enemies on Arrakis. When Liet Kynes is sent into the desert to die, the Harkonnen ensure that he has no still suit or water, knowing full well that either the desert or a worm will kill him. He's actually killed by a pre-spice mass. Regardless of the dependency of the Fremen upon them, the still suit represents a fascinating system created with the notion of man being in harmony with nature. As a concept, it is often one of the most discussed aspects of Herbert's Dune universe, and in consideration, also is an excellent means to show the sophistication of the Fremen as a tribal people. <laughs> <laughs>